Welcome to the Neon Noise Podcast, your home for learning ways to attract more traffic to your website, generate more leads, convert more leads into customers, and build stronger relationships with your customers. And now, your hosts, Justin Johnson and Ken Franzen. Hey, Neon Noise Nation, welcome to the Neon Noise Podcast, where we decode marketing and sales topics to help you grow your business. I am Justin, and with me, I have my co host, Ken. Ken, I hope all is well for you today. How is everything going? Things are going great, Justin. How about yourself? Things are going good for me as well. Thank you for asking. Our featured guest today is an expert when it comes to personal accountability and who doesn't need a little more of that. John Miller is the founder of QBQ Inc., a Denver-based organizational development firm dedicated to helping organizations make a personal personal accountability a core value. John has invested a decade selling leadership and management training. His QBQ material was developed facilitating 10,000 hours of training inside corporations in all industries. A 1980 graduate of Cornell University, John lives in Denver with his wife, Karen. The Millers have six daughters, one son, and seven grandchildren. John has written a handful of books, including Million Selling QBQ, The Question Behind the Question. John, it seems like you have quite a bit going on. Please fill in the blanks on anything I may have missed. Well, seven kids, uh, seven grandchildren. We're a productive group. You are a busy, <laughs> busy man. <laughs> yeah, we didn't start out this way. You know, we kind of just got married in 1980. My wife was 19 and I was 22 and we knew we wanted kids, but seven? Never, right. expect, never expect that. <laughs> That's and then I thought we were crazy with three apiece. Seven is uh, that's that's setting a bar there. Well, I guess I win if it's a contest. <laughs> and you, you definitely that's good mine for sure. Now, I have a question for you, Justin. Uh, I've always had told Justin to test these waters, um, but uh, Justin's got this theory that once you get past three, that four, this five, six, and seven, that it wow. just it plateaus <laughs> out. The craziness plateaus out. Does that have any validity to it, John? Well, I think you go into a comatose state. <laughs> and for about a decade you just don't know what's going on you don't remember uh, anything later on and, and now my wife and i if the grandkids aren't here we just stare at each other and say what do we do now oh let's take a nap let's sure get out absolutely <laughs> by the way i don't think that i ever said five six or seven i think i said four maybe yeah. maybe i, I, I have a tendency <laughs> to exaggerate a bit Here's the key. You start to take care of each other then you can just leave yeah, that's right i love it <laughs> All right, John. So stuff. let's kick off with uh, something I've been wondering. What does QBQ stand for? And, and how did you come sure. up with the idea? Well, a little background here. I came out of Cornell in 1980 and I joined a really big company called Cargill. And I was a grain trader, you know, corn and soybeans and wheat and oats. And my wife and I moved around from Mankato, Minnesota to Great Falls, Montana, St. Louis, Missouri, back to Minneapolis. And after about five years, I realized I was not an eight to five, Monday through Friday desk guy. I was bored. I was disillusioned, borderline depressed. Self-esteem had dropped through the floor, just was not enjoying my work life. And a friend said, why don't you get into sales? And I remember thinking, what, me? Sales? No way. Well, uh, I think he saw something I didn't. So I started interviewing for some sales positions, and I landed a position selling leadership and management training in Minneapolis, St. Paul, with a company based out of Georgia. They were looking for a local rep to work the Twin Cities. Well, gentlemen, I found my niche. Cold calling, senior executives on the phone, uh, pushing my way into their office, making appointments with them, making presentations, talking with executives, thinking like an executive. I did that for 10 years. And I ran about 10,000 hours of workshops with senior managers, middle managers, and I sat in these sessions, and that's where I mined the QBQ, the question behind the question. That's what QBQ stands for, the question behind the question. So my material, as your listeners enjoy it today, they will notice it's, it feels real, and it feels real because it is real. It's very organic. I didn't create this at Cornell University where Ken Blanchard and Tom Peters and I all went to school, even though they are way older than I am. <laughs> I, got this. I, got, I got this from real people sitting in sessions over the years, and I began to notice we all tend to ask some really lousy questions. Like, I'll just give you one example, and then I'll stop, let you ask a question. 
whatever you want to do. But I, I, I would hear, when is someone going to train me? And I remember thinking, there's got to be a better question there. And one day I turned it around. I said, why don't we ask the question behind the question? How can I develop myself? What can nice. I do to develop my talents? In other words, take ownership, take responsibility, take personal accountability for my personal growth. So that's an example of what we call an IQ, incorrect question, is when is someone going to train me? And the QBQ, the question behind the question is, wait a minute, what can I do to develop myself? So here we are, years later, I'm still out there teaching the same message because it's all about personal accountability. And sometimes people will come up to me, uh, Justin and Ken, and they'll say, oh, it's so timely. And I'll say, well, thank you, but not really. Uh, personal accountability is timeless. It worked 22 years ago when I created the QBQ. It worked last year. It works today. And next week I fly to New Jersey to speak for a big uh, manufacturer of copiers. And I'm going to teach the same material because personal accountability in the QBQ is timeless. Makes sense. John, you say in the QBQ book, there are two myths of accountability. Tell us about those. It's funny how those came to be, Justin. When you teach, when you speak, when you train, not only are you giving people information, of course, but you're also clearing their minds of the junk, the garbage, the errant thinking that they already might possess. And around accountability, there's two errant ideas, incorrect ideas that have crept into the corporate world. And that's where I came up with the two myths of accountability, because if I didn't talk about them, people would stay thinking about, well, accountability is this or accountability is that. No. Accountability is not these two things. Number one myth is we think it's something that the team does. We think it's a group thing. And that's because over the past three decades, I'd say, and I've been in the training industry since 86, there has been a ton of team building and so much team building, you know, management teams going off to the river and coming back the next day and their new mantra is, hey, we got wet together. Now we can work together. <laughs> so well, true. <laughs> just one more fad, all the team building we've done. Now, I'm not saying we should not engage in teamwork. I'm not saying collaboration is bad. Of course, it's good. But uh -huh. when we focus so much on teams, we lose sight of the individual. We lose sight of the Justins and the Kens and the Johns of the world, the yeah. power of one. <clears throat> so, so personal accountability is not a group thing. It's a me thing. There's a myth going around the training industry. There are no eyes in team. Baloney. Every team I can find, whether it's the Denver Broncos or the Miller family, is full of eyes. Yeah. And the eyes are named John and Kristen and Karen and Tara and Michael and Molly. When the eyes take personal accountability, the team can do great things. So that's the first myth is we think it's a team thing. Second myth of accountability is we think it's something I do to others. It's, we think it's something I hold others to. That's why my wife and I wrote a book called Raising Accountable Kids. <laughs> Raising Accountable Kids is all about accountability in parenting. And what's always so funny is people initially, moms and dads, will think, oh, I could really use that book for my 12-year-old. Uh, no, mom and dad, the book is not for your 12-year-old. It's for mom and dad. It's for sure. you. It's not about yes. holding my kid accountable. It's about mom and dad looking in the mirror saying, what can I do to be a more effective parent today? Also, sure. managers. My, my first 10 years in this industry was training managers. And I heard this a lot, you know, managers basically saying, I'm going to call my team in on Tuesday and I'm going to give it, give them what's what. And I'm going to hold them all accountable. And that's one of the myths in the corporate world that accountability is something I do to others. Now, managers, you do need to work with your people, hold them accountable, set standards, objectives, coach, terminate, hire, all those things managers do. But QBQ is not about holding someone else accountable. It's about me doing it myself. So the two myths are we think accountability is a group thing. We think it's something I hold others to. No. What is personal accountability? Well, in the QBQ book, we write it's all about making better choices in the moment. Better choices in the moment. And that's what QBQ, the question behind the question, helps John Miller do every day. So why, is, why would personal accountability... Uh, where does that, how important is that to, you know, I, I look at this myself uh, with the, individually, you mentioned parenting and I have three small children and I can't wait to, to, to jump into that a little bit, but I want to sidetrack no there. But <laughs> you don't have any large children. No, I don't. Well, the, the eight year old's getting pretty big, 
<laughs> but the two year old and the four year old are still very tiny. Um, in but so. but personal accountability in organizations is something as well because Justin and I have a team that we we quote unquote manage we work with and it fascinates me the accountability word gets thrown around a lot and those two myths you bring up are very true and uh, strike strike home a little bit uh, mm -hmm. so I'm interested to learn more about why it's so so important so imperative in, in both personal and professional. I certainly, here's the value in this message of personal accountability, the QBQ, the question man, the question. There are three very human traps we all fall into. And obviously they exist everywhere. My daughter, Kristen, she's 34. She's on my team, been out speaking on QBQ since she was 25, nine years. Nice. She lives in Minnesota. I'm down here in Denver. We travel the country doing really the exact same content, even though we have different styles. And one thing she's learned is she can speak for the management team of a Girl Scout troop, as she has in Western New York. And then she can go speak for a sales team at Best Buy. And then she can go speak to North Carolina, some industrial firm. And guess what? They all need QBQ. Why? Because there's a very human trap, or three, three of them actually. And the first one is victim thinking. And how do we know we're in victim thinking is when we ask questions that begin with why and have a poor me tone. A couple examples. Why is this happening to me? Why don't they support me more? Why don't I ever get a break? Why isn't life fair? Anytime I ask a why question that has a poor me tone, I have simply decided today I will play victim. And here's what we ask every group. We say, when we play victim, who are we serving? And then we always warn them, careful with your answer. Because people think, well, I'm just serving myself. No. How am I growing, learning, and changing? How am I getting better? How am I going to be a better me tomorrow than I was today if I'm wallowing in victim thinking? Victim thinking serves nobody. The second trap is procrastination. You see that everywhere, of course, in life, but let's focus on organizations. People asking, when will that department do their job right? When will somebody give me the vision? When will they get me the information I need to make a decision? When will somebody improve this place? All these when questions are the same as saying, hey, today I'm going to be a procrastinator. Today, I will habitually defer action to a future time so as to render no value to others. <laughs> Can you imagine somebody actually saying today, I'm going to choose to add no value? Well, that's what we're doing when we're saying, when will they handle this? That's procrastination. And the third trap is blame. And that comes from whodunit questions. Who dropped the ball? Who missed the deadline? Who made the mistake? Whose dumb idea was that? The minute we ask questions like that, we are seeking a culprit. And in my book, Outstanding, 47 Ways to Make Your Organization Exceptional, we talk about Outstanding organizations, outstanding people never seek culprits. They solve problems. There's a big difference. So victim thinking, procrastination, and blame are the human traps that QBQ addresses. And you show me an organization that doesn't have that, and I will not believe you. If you try to present to me, <laughs> good luck, I, right? <laughs> my company doesn't have this problem. Baloney. All humans slip into victim thinking, procrastination, and blame. And one additional comment, the twin to victim thinking is entitlement, entitlement thinking. And that is a big problem today in our world, but I can't change society. I can only make sure John Miller does not feel he's entitled, but he feels he must earn his rewards in life. Yeah. So that's super interesting, all the different ways in which we phrase those. And because, I mean, I think we've all had those days we played the victim or, We've questioned procrastination or tried to push the blame when we, we, we go through that in our daily routines. What problems does the, the QBQ solve? Well, here's a good, good answer to a good question. It solves problems. What problems does it solve? It solves problems. Here's the key. If you have a problem in front of you, you as an individual, you and your, you and your spouse, you and your uh, colleagues at work, you and your staff at work, if there's a problem, how far along the problem-solving path are we going to get if we're pointing fingers at other people? If we're not taking ownership, if we're procrastinating, saying, when will somebody else handle this? If we're playing victim and saying, why does this keep happening to me? As long as I'm asking these why, when, and who questions, playing victim, procrastinating, and blaming, that problem in front of us will not be solved. That's one reason uh, Dave Ramsey, the personal finance host, loves the QBQ book is because he knows 
you can't get out of debt. Let's just say there's a couple in debt, man, a husband and wife in debt. You're never going to get out of debt as long as you're blaming the credit card companies for mailing you credit cards. As long as you're blaming, <laughs> as long as you're blaming the Joneses next door who you're trying to keep up with or, or blaming your spouse for his or her spending habits. There's right. no way to solve that debt problem when you're blaming. You must take personal accountability. Do you have some examples, some stories of, of QBQ and how how they've solved the problems, how, the, how we dove, dove into this and tackled the issues and came out on top? Well, the QBQ book is full of stories. I think that's one reason people enjoy it. Uh, there's an old line about being a preacher. My dad was a, a, a Christian preacher, pastor for 40 years, as well as Cornell wrestling coach for 26. So I grew up in a very nice. interesting home. <laughs> Bet. One day, one day he was the uh, wrestling coach with the big biceps, and the next day he was the loving, forgiving, grace-filled pastor. And I used to get out of bed and asking myself, which one will he be? <laughs> <laughs> which dad is showing up today? <laughs> but um, the the problem, the solving of problems, and the telling of the telling of stories is is in the book, in the QBQ book, is the way we teach the material. Because the old line about preaching is, if you're if you're not telling a story, you're preaching. If you're not telling a story, you're preaching. So in the QBQ book, we tell a lot of great stories because people just love stories. My dad was a storyteller. I had a couple of business mentors that got me into this business. They were storytellers, so I'm a storyteller. And we look at the QBQ book, and we break it down into a bunch of really great stories. And, and a lot of people have the favorite story, which is chapter one of the QBQ book, where I walked into the Rock Bottom restaurant on a Thursday, and it was really busy in there. And they, they stuck me over at the bar. There were no booths or tables. I didn't mind. I was alone. And a young man runs by me, and he's carrying a whole bunch of dirty dishes on a tray. And he stops, and he looks at me. And he stops. This is key. He's rushing to the kitchen. I am not in his area. He stops and says, sir, have you been helped? And I said, no, I haven't been, but I'm kind of in a rush. Well, I can help you. I said, well, great. I'd just like a, like a salad and a roll, maybe. He said, I can get you that. What would you like to drink? I said, well, I have a Diet Coke. It's my favorite, you know. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, we don't sell Coke, just Pepsi products. I said, Don, you know, I'll just have water and lemon. He says, great. So he takes off. A few minutes later, he's back with the salad and the roll and the water and the lemon. I thank him. He leaves. And this is a very key moment in this story, uh, Ken and Justin, because I was completely satisfied. But I want the listeners to think about their business. Do they have competition? Dumb question. Of course they do. So do we want to have the extra edge in the marketplace? Yes, we do. Where does that come from? The people going the extra mile. Yeah. There is no extra edge unless the people go the extra mile individually. So I'm sitting there enjoying my meal. I'm totally satisfied. Suddenly I feel the wind of enthusiasm blown behind my back. Long arm of service stretches over my shoulder and places right next to my plate a 20-ounce bottle of Diet Coke. <laughs> Nice. I was so surprised. I just said, wow, thanks. You're welcome. He takes off. My first thought, hire him. <laughs> no kidding. Sure. I, I just put a blog up on QBQ.com where we blog week, weekly about what we teach in the Outstanding book, hiring character over credentials. Hey, managers, HR department, stop hiring college degrees and start hiring character. That's what we want to bring onto our team. The heart of service, a desire to succeed, fire in the belly, energy, punctuality, accountability. So I called this guy over because I thought, well, maybe I'll put him on my team. And I said, uh -huh. I, thought, I thought you didn't sell Coke products. He says, we don't. I said, well, where did this come from? He said, grocery store around the corner. Nice. I said, you're kidding. Uh, who paid for it? He says, oh, I did, sir. Just a dollar out of my tip money. <laughs> I, love it. So praised, I, right? I asked him one more question <laughs> i said you've been busy how did you have time to go get it he straightens up he smiles and he he points toward the other area of the restaurant he says oh i didn't go get it sir i sent my manager nice. <laughs> who, who wouldn't that. want to send their, send their manager huh come on we all want to send our manager <laughs> i sent my manager. Well, there's more to that story. It's all taught in chapter one of the QBQ book. But here's the bottom line. It's funny. Next week, I'm speaking at my last child's high school graduation. Child number seven is graduating next week from high school. Congrats. Congrats. Yeah. And the principal actually asked me to come uh, keynote to speak. And I have only like you know 10 minutes. 
I'm going to tell that story. And here's why. That's an awesome story. Thank you. Here's why. Every high school senior graduating, moving on to work or college needs to know three things not to say. Never say, not my problem, not my job, not my department. And that is exactly what that young man at the rock bottom did. By the way, his name was Jacob Miller. I love his last name. (laughs) But think about it. As he ran past the bar area where I was sitting, he didn't say to himself, not my problem, not my department, not my job. He stopped. He turned. He faced the customer. He said, what can I do to serve you? That's what the QBQ and this message of accountability is all about. And I'm going to be teaching that to 800 parents and 200 graduates next week. They're going to love the story of Jacob Miller at the Rock Bottom Restaurant. That is a great story. John, your wife, Karen, and yourself recently written a parenting book. You've touched on it a little bit. Can you dive into that a little bit for our listening audience? Oh, absolutely. It's really born out of a couple principles. Number one, we believe parenting is a learned skill. I really want your parents on this broadcast to hear that. Parenting is a learned skill. Why is that important to accept? Because the really good parents out there, they're not winging it. They're also not always reaching out on Facebook for knowledge where there isn't any, and often it's the blind leading the blind. Oh, my God, that is so true. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Sometimes it's like, hey, what should I do with my three-year-old? He's carrying a steak knife around. <laughs> <laughs> Really? You got to ask your, your you got to ask your millennial peers what to do in that situation. Right. But we we encourage young parents and we're old now. I'm turning 59 this month. My wife is 50 <clears throat> something. Good for you. We encourage parents to find older parents with gray hair that you admire. They've done well. Their kids are out contributing to the world. They're succeeding in life not living at home on their parents' couch watching Walking Dead reruns. Right. (laughs) Go out and talk to those parents. Sit down. Sit at their feet. Learn from them. Ask them questions. And do not reject their wisdom with words like, well, we're different. We're different now. No. What worked in good parenting before still works. Now, please hear what I said. What worked in good parenting. Now, my dad, born in 1921 and raised by a guy born in 1890, He believed children should be seen and not heard. My wife and I did not feel quite that way, so we allowed our kids to have good discussion with us. But now the pendulum has gone so far, we think that the children in some families are running the household. There was a a show back in the 80s, you guys were probably raised on it, Charles in Charge. Oh, yeah. Oh, Charles in Charge. (laughs) Yeah, guess what? Now we have families that could be called Child in Charge. We have one of those right down the street. Well, it's sad when the child has the <laughs> do not yeah. let the pendulum swing so far that the child is running the household. Strong, accountable parenting is what Raising Accountable Kids, the book, is all about. Parenting is a learned skill. We can get better. Another key theme in the book is if you're having problems with your teenager, you probably had problems with your toddler. Here's the point. Yeah. These problems don't happen overnight. So often parents go, I've got a crazy teenager in my house, typical teen, acting out, rude, uh, drinking, whatever, you know, they're typical. (laughs) Stop stereotyping the teen just because you didn't parent him or her well when he was three or two. Sure. The problems you're having with your teenager, mom and dad, be it, this is key, this is accountability. We need to admit, okay, we probably had problems with him when he was a toddler, but we let him run the house. Now he's 13 or 15, and we're having bigger problems. So good parenting starts early. And the other theme in the book is this. My child is a product of my parenting, period. It's not Hollywood. It's not Donald Trump. It's not my church. It's not the youth group leaders. It's not public ed. My child is a product of my parenting. Do I sound a little angry? I don't mean to. But we see so much blame in the parenting world. Well, if only the schools would do this, or the churches would do that, or only if Donald Trump or Obama. No! My child is a product of my parenting. Bottom line, personal accountability. And that's what Raising Accountable Kids, the book, is all about. 
So true. Hey, John, I'm going to need to pick up a version of that and shoot that over to one of my neighbors. <laughs> well, actually, your wife emailed me and said you needed a copy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, John, in your, in your experiences, when, when you come across uh, someone with that troubled teen, is, is that more challenging to, to course correct a teenager than a toddler? Absolutely, it would be more difficult later in life, but certainly we don't not learn, grow, and change just because the child is 14 or 15. Sure. We actually end the Raising Accountable Kids book with a quick story where a woman who had gotten an advanced copy of the book or maybe one of my blogs, I'd have to go read the story again, said, wish I'd had that when my son was young. Now he's graduating from high school. It's probably too late. No. Negative. Never. Never too late. To look in the mirror, mom and dad. See, here's the key to great parenting. When our kids are young, we are building. But when they're older, we are relating. And that is the leap that most parents, some parents, not, I, I misspoke, some parents never make. So that's why you see fathers trying to tell their 24-year-old son what to do with his life. That's not good. Because that dad hasn't made the leap from building children when they're 5, 10, 15 to relating to that child. And the problem with our society today is we've extended childhood right into adulthood. Whether it's kids staying on mom and dad's health care till they're 26 or living at home, returning to the nest, whatever you want to call it. I'm not making a political statement. What I'm saying is we have extended childhood. Trust me, in the 1800s, we didn't have kids living at home at 18, lying on the couch doing nothing. They were milking cows at 4 a.m. Yeah. So we, we really, it really is important to recognize as our kids grow, and let's just use 18 or 19 as adulthood, we need to start relating to them and not trying to build them. Because you see, as we let go and ask, how can I be a better parent? The relationship strengthens with our child as they age. We don't want to push our adult kids away. The, the loneliest person in the world is a mom or a dad who is estranged from their adult children. Sure. John, you say the cornerstone of personal accountability is I can only change me. What do you mean by that? Here's what I discovered early when I was teaching QBQ in the mid-90s. I was, you know, a new keynote speaker running around the country. And I was doing sessions for some really high-quality companies, if I could share, like Merck Pharmaceutical and State Farm. State Farm found me in one session in San Antonio, Texas, and it turned into 75 sessions across the country. So I had some... I had some early experience with really quality people. These are good people, good corporations. But I learned something by doing so much speaking so early in my career. People were sitting there thinking, personal accountability. Wow, what a great message for my spouse. <laughs> what a great message for my son. What a great message for my staff. And I learned, you know, I'm, I'm a good salesperson, gentlemen. So I learned the way I sell this program is you talk to an executive, you get them to read the QBQ book, and I know what they're going to be thinking. They're going to be thinking, everybody on my staff needs this material. So that's why they hire us to come speak. That's the motivation deeply. But the truth still is, that executive can't change his staff. A father can't change his son. A manager can't change an employee. Let's stick with that one for a minute. Manager can't change the, the employee. I sold management training for 10 years. Here's what I saw over and over and over again. I'm going to motivate that person till it kills him. <laughs> That's what managers would try to do, especially sales managers. They thought it was their job to motivate the people. Well, I'm sorry. Only God can, can put inspiration into a human being. All managers can do is kill it. Managers have to create an environment that brings out that natural God-given inspiration to good management. We can't put it there. And same with uh, parenting. You've got a son that wants to be a musician. You cannot turn him into a physician. You've got to let him be what he wants to be. Even if he learns some tough lessons through life, I can't change him. I can't change my people. And it all started when I go teach these sessions and people would come up to me and say, wow, I can't wait to go home and tell my wife about this. She really needs it. She plays victim all the time. <laughs> so bottom line, when like, uh, Dave Ramsey has me on an interview and you guys just asked it, 
essentially, they will say, what's the number one takeaway from the QBQ message, whether it's training or live speaking or the book? And I always say the same thing. I can only change me. So true. In I, I you, you say that in, in the in the explanation you give, it, it's interesting how much we focus on changing others and, and completely avoiding ourselves. It's less painful. I do believe one of the most powerful negative emotions that drives human beings is embarrassment. We might think it's anger and hurt, and those are all really bad things. But I got to tell you, I think probably the primary worst emotion is embarrassment. Nobody likes to be embarrassed. And you see, the immature person who cannot say, I did it, my bad, I was wrong, I blew it, probably fears being embarrassed for actually making a mistake. Yet, as we grow emotionally, we move through that period in life where we're afraid to be embarrassed. And we say, you know what? I did blow it. I did make that mistake. I'm sorry. And by the way, there is no but after I'm sorry. I'm sorry ends with a period. Sure. That's important to remember because I do make mistakes. I do do things wrong. I can only change me. I need to be able to admit that, but there's no but or however once I do, once I admit it. In this world we live in, it, it's almost impossible to to feel like you you're able to be wrong it i think so many people feel like they have to be perfect all oh absolutely sure see it's a gotcha culture we live in the gotcha culture our president can never make a mistake because then the other party will rip him apart any president i'm not talking about a specific president sure we've created a culture where nobody can just admit they did something wrong or they're going to get slammed or of course we could Mm. talk about social media for an hour yeah but that's, I still, that's all no, social media say, is about. Right. I will still say this. When someone comes out and says, I made a mistake, I blew it, I'm sorry, and shows humility, what we call the cornerstone of leadership in the QBQ book. Humility is the cornerstone of leadership. I think more often than not, most people will stand down and say, you know what? That was good. That person admitted he did wrong. He's showing humility. He's being contrite. He's admitting a mistake. That's good. But we have to be careful with this gotcha social media driven society we've created because it's awfully mm-hmm. hard for people to come out and say I did wrong. Simply don't see it. <laughs> you don't. Well, it sure would be nice to see politicians. I get this question all the time. Hey, John, have you sent 535 books to Congress yet? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Um, I've got political opinions, but I can only change the stuff. If I'm going to rail against entitlement thinking, I need to make sure I have not become entitled in my life or something. Sure, sure. That's good stuff. <laughs> now, John, you mentioned your daughter, Kristen, and you you recently created a, a QBQ program for schools, is it? Yes, yeah, she designed a curriculum called I Own It. Okay. And it's all about bringing personal accountability into a young person's life by you know, building character, building character through personal accountability. But the title is I Own It. We actually, interestingly enough, we're sitting with a superintendent of schools in our area a few years ago. And, you know, we are going to call it personal accountability for youth or something like that. And I don't know what question we asked this superintendent. And he said, well, what you do find is the great kids out there in the schools own it. They own their grades. They own their results. And I remember Kristen and I, we looked at each other and said, duh, perfect title. Because you see, the ineffective youth and the ineffective parent are going to blame the schools and the teachers, whereas the the effective parent and, of course, the budding mature youth is going to say, you know, I didn't study hard enough. I didn't know my material. I need to do better. So that's what it's about. And it's really a curriculum uh, can design for sixth graders through seniors, the classroom, the teachers can use in the classroom, and they can really walk the youth through the QBQ content, do exercises, and apply it to that age group. And so it's sold at our website, qbq.com, and also Amazon carries I own it. Nice. That's amazing. That's the, I mean, why not start bringing these concepts to, to surface earlier on instead of, uh, letting it become a, uh, a problem to begin with, right? 
Totally agree with that. And that's one thing we're trying to do. I'm going to tell you right now, the Miller family is far from perfect. But one thing we don't allow is excuse making. And I just posted this on our QBQ, our Facebook page, which is the QBQ, T-H-E QBQ on Facebook. I basically put up a block or an image that said, you know, outstanding people or leaders don't make excuses, but neither do they accept excuses. That's great. <laughs> not to be harsh, not to be mean. But if you're a really good manager, you've set a, you've created a culture where excuse making just isn't allowed. It's part of the culture. And in your home, if you've created that kind of accountable culture, your kids will start to make an excuse. Then they'll stop. They'll go, you know what? I blew it. I was wrong. And that's really fun when, when you start seeing young people start owning uh, their life like that. Yeah. i got a second grader that that would work great with. Now well, send him my way. I'll take care of him. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Now, why you brought the, the outstanding? Why why did you decide to write outstanding, John? Because of knocking around the corporate world for all these years, I had just picked up a lot of ideas that I wasn't teaching in my QBQ sessions or in uh, the QBQ book. So just to give your your listeners a feel. We're talking about things like the outstanding organization. Inside that outstanding organization, this is what happens. Uh, They treat vendors like people. They tend to the little things. They're fast. Decisions are made quickly. They celebrate success. They make no excuses. Outstanding organizations hire character over degrees and credentials. In outstanding organizations, managers are trained and developed, not just promoted. People are coachable. So there's 47 things that I've picked up over the years that I found in really outstanding organizations. And that's what outstanding is all about. So what, what does it take for, for a person or an organization to to be outstanding? Read my book. (laughs) (laughs) Pick up my book and you'll understand. Perfect. Well, Well, as, as in, as in anything, we even say this in the preface of the outstanding book, tying it a little bit to the message of accountability is no matter what your position at your company, don't wait for someone else to become outstanding. Well, you know, I'll be better when they're more effective or I'll do this when they do that. Or I just had a guy the other day, the HR vice president told him he needed to take more risk, take more action. He said, you need, you even need to go rogue sometimes. (laughs) <laughs> but because they're trying to change the culture from, you know, controlling and my way or the highway culture to people getting people to take risks and doing things. He told him, yeah. sometimes you need to go rogue. Guess what he said? Well, I'll go rogue when I have permission. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I'll go rogue when I have permission. Well, that's what going rogue is all about, doing stuff without permission. Sure. All right. And that's what outstanding people actually really do. They take risk. They have what we call positive failures. They fail, but they learn from it. Take action. Take action. So So the Outstanding Book teaches people, don't wait for someone down the hall to be outstanding. It's my job to do that today. So one of my favorite phrases out there is, it's better to ask for forgiveness than, beg for forgiveness and ask for permission. Does that kind of follow that, uh, maybe a touch? Well, that certainly would, sure. We want we want people to be willing to take risks. Uh, the last chapter of Outstanding, or the second to the last, is titled "Try, Risk, Grow." Try, Risk, Grow. If I don't try, if I don't risk, I'll never grow. That speaks to people and that speaks to organizations. But what you just said, you know, seeking forgiveness before permission, you just summed up John Miller's life. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Meaning, I just, my wife and I are so different, and that's where QBQ comes into play. She's a feeler. She's sensitive to others' needs. I'm a logical guy. I worry about myself. So we both we both have strengths. I mean, mm-hmm. one, of the, one of the reasons focusing on you is good is you stay healthier and you also can get things done in a state yeah. of line. Okay. But if I take that to an extreme, I'll become a lonely, selfish old man. My wife mm-hmm. is other-centered. People adore her. She serves their needs. If she goes too far, burnout and stress. So you bring John and Karen together, we're very, very different. One's a feeler, one's a logical creature. QBQ helps us make that work. We've been married 37 years. And we nice. do that by asking simply, well, 
I might be frustrated with my partner, but what can I do to let it go? How can I today flex? What can I do to change me? See, years ago, we could have put incompatible on a legal document and probably nobody would have blinked an eye because we are really different. But we're committed to marriage, the institution, the kids. We love each other. And QBQ, being accountable in the marriage, has helped us stay together and make it work. Awesome. So if if people only get one idea from all the content you create, what would you hope that that be? I really believe the best thing they can walk away from is this sudden realization, (laughs) so funny, of something they already knew. I can only change me. So here's the key. Uh, Think about who you've been trying to fix. Come on, really. You've got a teenage daughter you've been trying to fix. You've got a, a worker, co-worker. You've got a staff member, maybe a neighbor. Maybe it's Uncle Joe or Aunt Jane. Who are you been trying to fix? Today's the day to ask what we call the ultimate QBQ, the ultimate QBQ. I'm going to give it to your listeners for free. How can I let go of what I can't control? Wow, what a great question. How can I let go of what I can't control? Identify the person you've been trying to fix. Ask that QBQ, how can I let go of what I can't control? And then turn it around and say, what can I do to change me? And man, will you have a good day. Oh, I bet. That's that's great advice. Earlier, you, you mentioned Dave Ramsey makes his entire staff read. I think you said it's the number one book, the first book that, yes. that you have is QBQ. Can I mention that, that. here? Yeah. Uh, Dave Ramsey contact. Okay. The QBQ <clears throat> book was originally written, originally written in 01. Now we're into the fifth edition. It's just been relaunched in 2017. It's fresh. It's new again. It's been edited. It's better than ever. But you see, earlier I said the content's timeless. So we still continue to sell the QBQ book and teach it everywhere. Dave Ramsey found it at a bookstore in 2002, stood there in the bookstore and read a third of it or a half of it because it's a very quick read. And then he felt so guilty he'd read half of it, he decided he should buy it. (laughs) So he bought it, took it back to his Nashville office. I got a call from an assistant. She said, Dave Ramsey wants you on his show. I said, who's Dave Ramsey? He said, blah, blah, blah. I went on the show, and here we are all these years later. I went on 12 or 13 times, but like I said, who's counting? And when he had a Fox, he had a Fox Business TV show for a few years, I was on that a few times. And yes. it all stemmed from that uh, fortuitous moment where he picked up the book in a bookstore and decided all of his staff should read it. So he's got like five or six books now a new employee has to read. QBQ is still number one. I love that idea. That's awesome. Well, and here's the key. Personal accountability is the foundation to everything. So that's what always kills me when companies say, well, we're going to do sales training, not personal accountability. Well, wait a minute. Why teach a sales rep how to sell if they're going to be blaming corporate for not enough advertising? Sure. Well, you're going to do team building. Okay, fine. Do team building. But you need to bring QBQ in first because as long as you have finger pointing and blame, the team's going to fall apart anyway. Well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do customer service training. Yeah, but you need QBQ because they need to understand that Jacob Miller story that I that I tell in chapter one and, and the yeah. service. So QBQ and personal accountability, Ken and Justin, always come first. It's foundational. That makes total sense. I think that uh, we're going to have to uh, get ourselves. Uh, I, I, I began the book. I, I want to finish through it. And I think that uh, that might be a, a new step in the Neon Goldfish training Program I think that's a wonderful employees. idea. Actually, I think you you folks should spend like a half a million dollars on QBQ training. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem, well, John. Okay, fine. 20 grand, you can hire my daughter, Kristen, okay? <laughs> you got it, buddy. <laughs> that's that's obviously a deal, so. <laughs> right. That's a discount just for discount you. Discount for, for being on the show. But she'd love to come to Toledo. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, we, we don't want to do that type of training in our Orlando location because, uh, well, we, we don't want to be distracted by the beautiful weather. So we'll come here to Toledo where focus will Good be the stuff. key. <laughs> what you're saying is Toledo training would be an oxymoron. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Slightly. Uh, good stuff. John, you get uh, probably some some emails, some feedback, some different things from uh, people that read your books or that you've spoken to at conferences. What what do they tend to tell you? I get two types of emails. One is 
yeah, I've been trying to fix my husband or my wife or my kid or my boss. And I needed to really hear that message today about letting go and working on me. So that that's one theme I get. I'm also, now that I'm old, getting another line of emails. And that is people who saw me speak in 1998 at Wells Fargo and now are the CFO of Caterpillar are emailing me saying, hey, I'm now at this company. Can you come speak for us? So I will say uh, longevity is a good thing. And we get a lot of emails now from people who have known of QBQ for various wa- in various ways, whether they read the book, went through our in-house training program, or saw me speak years ago, who are now coming back because they're now in their second or third career. And they're saying, my new team needs QBQ. So that's always fun to see. Awesome. Excellent. Now, we've touched on a lot of the books, but flipping the switch, we haven't... Uh, maybe I'm mistaken, but have we touched on that? Where does that no, fit into everything? It's really the companion book to QBQ. I suppose every author has what we call a lost book, kind of a lost book, you know, probably whatever John Grissom wrote later after the firm didn't do as well as the firm. <laughs> well, we've got QBQ, people love it. And then we have to tell them, but there's another book. It's called Flipping the Switch and it takes QBQ to the next level. What it does is uses the QBQ methodology for bringing Uh, what we call advantage principles. If you want to have an advantage in life, we need to engage in learning, service, trust, ownership, and creativity. Those are the five principles taught in Flipping the Switch, and they're all brought to life by using the QBQ. So QBQ and Flipping the Switch are very much a good set. They're a good pair of books to have together. Awesome. Awesome. Good stuff. Hey, guys, I think we're getting pretty close to time. Hey, John, if you had one piece of parting advice... For our listening audience, what would that be? I'm going to go back. I don't mean to be a broken record, but, you know, I'm going to go back to, I would recommend you think about who who has been frustrating you lately. The greatest okay. frustration we all have, usually, is people, other people. You know, spouses or kids or friends or neighbors or coworkers or bosses. Come on, identify that person you've been trying to fix that you're frustrated with. You've been trying to fix them and, and apply the QBQ. Get the QBQ book. Uh, and ask, start asking, how can I let go of what I can't control and what can I do to change me? And if you want to email me, john at qbq.com, it's just that simple, j-o-h-n at qbq.com. I respond to every email I get. I'd love to hear Perfect. from you who you've pictured, who's been frustrating, who, who's been, who, who have you been trying to fix? And today, because of this broadcast, you decided to let it go and look in the mirror and say, how can I improve me? Nice. All right. So you guys understand how to get a hold of John. Where would they go to purchase your books if they would like to? QBQ.com. QBQ.com has everything we offer. And of course, you know, all the books are out there at Amazon, BarnesandNoble.com, all those places. But uh, if you want to start and just look at a page that displays all of our books, QBQ.com qbq.com awesome well hey neon noise nation we hope you enjoyed our conversation today with john go over and check him out at qbq.com as always the show notes from today will be available at neongoldfish.com forward slash podcast until next time this is justin ken and john go out and start crushing it make personal accountability a core value we will see you guys again next week thank you for listening to this episode of the Neon Noise Podcast. Did you enjoy the podcast? If so, please subscribe, share with a friend, or write a review. We want to cover the topics you want to hear. If you have an idea for a topic you'd like Justin and Ken to cover, connect with us on Twitter at Neon Goldfish or through our website at neongoldfish.com.